Um, I'm about to introduce our amazing two, uh, two speakers, creatives, and, uh, and the people who are going to host this incredible screening. Oh, yeah, and make sure your phones are on silent as well, just, uh, not just no photography and no videography. So James Honeybourne is like, I just met him upstairs and I was super cool about it, but I'm like a massive, massive fan. James is the executive producer of Freeborn Media, and before he created Freeborn Media, he was based at the incredible world-renowned BBC Natural History Unit. Um, you may recognise some of his work, David Attenborough's hit series, um, Africa, the Emmy-nominated Royal New Zealand, the BAFTA-winning Big Blue Life, and of course, the final BBC blockbuster that he did before setting up um, Freeborn Media, which is Blue Planet 2, which many of us um, uh, watched absolutely wrapped with that incredible, incredible work. Um, uh, he since setting up Freeborn Media, he's been making films and TV in a creative partnership with Netflix. The first series, Our Great National Parks, premiered last year. It was narrated by Barack Obama and it won a primetime Emmy for Outstanding Narrator. So really looking forward to hearing from James because Freeborn Media specialises in underwater filming. And I think what we might hear is a little bit how some of these incredible clips and content are really, really hard to make. <laughs> um, uh, James will be born by Danny Washington. Now, Danny doesn't need a lot of introduction because many of you will recognise her. Danny is a TV host and a science communicator, and she's been working for 15 years making some of the most incredible content on US TV. She was the first African American woman to host a nationally syndicated science series. Whoa, whoa that's huge! Exploration Nature Knows Best. It was aired by 90. It was aired to 95 million homes on Fox. Wow, she has much, much, much more influence than I do in the world. Um, she stands at the intersection of science, sustainability, and public engagement. She's worked on Deadly Sharks of Paradise, on Discovery's Shark Week, Ocean Invaders on PBS Nova, Mission Unstoppable of CBS, and Disney Junior's Ariel, where she was voicing the character of Tanti, which means I'm going to have to take a selfie with her and send it to my nieces. She co-founded the non-profit Big Blue and New and authored the book Bold Women in Science. She's such a huge advocate for action on our oceans. I can't think of a better combination than the wonderful James and wonderful Danny to take us forward. Please welcome them as they come up here. We can do better than that. Woo, 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 woo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Solitaire. This is amazing to be here tonight. How many of you are having a wonderful climate week so far? Thank you. Thank you, but wonderful. I know many of you are probably bouncing around the city quite a bit to make it to lots of events. So thank you for choosing to be here at the Solutions House. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I feel honored. I mean, I get goosebumps listening to your bio, James. It's incredible what you've been able to accomplish. Um, I, I just, yeah, I feel honored to sit next to you right now because you're doing real work for the ocean, the place that covers 71% of our planet and bringing stories to life uh, underwater and, and opening up a world for so many people that may never, never get a chance to be underwater to see it for themselves. So yeah, I'm excited. So I think we're going to go forward first with just introducing the folks in this room to the trailer that launched today, cool. right? And um, let's take a quick peek at this trailer and get excited about the series. You can roll the clip. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, I get goosebumps every time I see it. And I think it's really just giving us, a, once again, a glimpse into a place where so many people haven't had a chance to connect with under the waves. And there's a line in the trailer that your wonderful narrator says, who happens to be <clears throat> former President Barack Obama. <laughs> He says, the world will never be the same once you've seen it from below. And I think that's really profound when we talk about the ocean. Um, you're bringing that life below water to, to, to the audiences all over the world. And you've had extensive experience capturing these stories as a director uh, throughout your career. I'm curious if you can just share the perceptions that you hope will change as a result of this series and inspiring other people to get involved with animals under the waves. Okay, thank you. So lovely to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do is show you a few clips from different episodes. We're not showing a whole film, um, but I hope it will be um, it'll be fun to 
to share it because, well, it will be for me because uh, we haven't shown anyone this before. Uh, so it is literally like at a sequence level, world premiere time. So realize I'm a little bit echoey, but that. Okay, so um, the series um, has been over five years in the making. And our ambition is ultimately to help audiences connect with a world that is, um, it's out of sight and out of mind most of the time, you know. Most people encounter fish on a plate. And, and yet, it's a world that is vitally important to our own. Um, so we spent over five years, 700 people around the world, many local teams, um, 4,000 hours clocked up underwater, 1,000 species filmed. Um, we've been down to the deep ocean at both poles. Um, we have some 20 plus scientific papers being written on discoveries made during filming. Just because we're spending longer down there than many people get to, I think it's just an amazing place, still full of new discoveries. So it is a series that's full of um, new, new species, incredible places, and amazing new behaviors. And we can't wait to you know, share it with everyone. Um, it's really important to us that people feel connected to this world and that we help them. You know, it's an opportunity really to meet species, not just underwater, but on their eye line. You know, no matter the animal size, we'll try and meet it on its eye line and immerse ourselves in it as well. Try and discover the challenges it faces because if we do that, it actually helps us relate to these sea creatures better. And suddenly a world which can be cold and dark and slimy and full of, you know, alien looking things, it can be, um, it can be incredibly surprising me, like our own. It's, it's wonderful and it's relatable. And that touch point is really important because we know that if we can get to understand and have empathy for these creatures, then we'll come to care for them more. Mm. And, um, and then we know that's how we start to, to, to really get that sense of engagement with this, this other world. Um, James, I'm curious, I mean, yeah. a lot of people perceive the ocean to be a very scary place, with yeah. good reason, right? It's, it's deep, yeah. it's cold, it's dark, and like you said, you, you go down to the depths, you get eye level, at eye level with those creatures to showcase their lifestyle and what they're doing in their daily existence. Um, why do you think this is so essential to engaging in storytelling that will then inspire people to, to protect these places? Well, we know, um, I, I've had I've been fortunate enough because of Blue Planet, we, we had this so-called Blue Planet effect afterwards where hundreds of thousands of people went out and beach cleaned and got involved and used less single-use plastics. And we saw this response. We never in the films told them to do that. We just presented the issue of plastic pollution in a way that felt tangible to audiences. And, and because we had invoked a, an empathy and an emotion, people wanted to care. And then you get this wonderful warmth of the human response and you see that people you know when you see a problem you actually want to engage with it and do something about it and so that that makes me hugely hopeful and optimistic it really does and actually excited to share these things which is why we don't frame out the fishing nets we don't frame out the plastic pollution and we don't frame out the effects of climate change right we, we have to show the real situation that we're seeing out in our ocean right now. And exactly. I, we're going to see that in just a few minutes with some of these special clips that, once again, never before, before seen clips from the series, and um, you all are going to be some of the first people to see it in the world, so that's really exciting. Um, I think we should move on to our first clip. Let's get yeah. it jump-started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this clip you're going to watch is one of our most iconic marine species that we see in the ocean that people have definitely grown to love and love anyway. It's a majestic marine mammal known as the humpback whale. And uh, this time it's showcasing a very unique behavior, never before, before seen. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's great. You know, these, an these animals are, um, they face a very fast changing world. They're having to be incredibly inventive. And, you know, I think it's an example of how inspiring nature can be in the face of this fast changing world. Excellent, we can roll that clip. Wow. <laughs> That was an impressive scene. And that's a scene that I've never witnessed on television ever. And I'm assuming, I mean, not assuming anything actually. How did you find out about this story in the first place on your team? I mean, this is so unique. 
oh, we've got a big team of researchers, and they, and they, um, you know, they spend that first year um, just looking into stories. And um, we get to work with amazing scientists all over the world as well. And we love to collaborate with science because we get so many of our stories from science. We try and give back when we can. So we develop. In this case, you know, it's obviously under scientific permit, but you can um, get these very immersive cameras that go onto the, you know, the backs of the whales. And they're just attached with a very simple suction cup so that it floods and comes off after a few hours. But it allows us and the scientists to really get an understanding of what's going on in this murky water, how they're behaving, what the new techniques might be, and how ultimately, you know, they can make the um, returns of the salmon uh, more efficient whilst also um, you know, not harming the, the, the whales. And I think for me, the thing about it really is um, the, uh, just how inspiring it is, how inventive and ingenious, you know, nature can be. Um, despite the problems and the barriers we seem to be putting up in the oceans, um, you know, there's a persistence and a sort of heroicness to, the, to what they're up to, I think. Yeah, it's quite an adaptive behavior, and I think developing new hunting strategies is something that a lot of marine species have to do now uh, with our current circumstances. But I mean, being able to frame it in a way that you did, especially with the writing, that's one of my favorite parts about it. It was so well written. I mean, a fisheries Fort Knox, like, <laughs> it's fantastic to tell the story in a fun way, to well, be yeah. a little playful. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, we, I, I, it has to be, we have to be playful in our communications. You know, this is, we want people to watch this in, in millions. So we want it to be entertaining and to be fun, to be enjoyable. And, and that's the first step in that pathway towards, you know, coming to care about it. So yeah, we want it to be fun and it should be fun. And um, as you can tell, um, our narrator's enjoying himself. And <laughs> Having a really good time. And the body cam footage, as you mentioned, was, was very unique as well. That's yeah, well, that's, that's also part of the immersion. And if we're going to really try and immerse people in that world, we've got to take them to meet the, the animals doing what they're doing, you know, and to experience it as much as possible, make it experiential. And that's how we're going to get more empathy for, for what's going on underwater. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the next clip we have to show, um, it's really featuring another creative, very creative marine creature, but this time it's a beloved invertebrate that many of you I'm sure love as well, living on the seafloor, the veined octopus. We can roll the clip. <laughs> what an incredible scene, wow. I mean, it's a stark contrast. I mean, we see the human waste, but we also see these creatures doing their thing and utilizing what they have. Again, creativity to the max. But, you know, what did you hope when your team captured this story? First of all, first question, how long did it take to film this story? And second, what did it, what did it feel like when you saw those clips and, and saw the story that was emerging out of that? Well, we had no idea an octopus would do that. No one did. It's not <laughs> known scientifically. It was a total new discovery. Um, and it was just because we spent 70 hours on the seabed hanging out with an octopus. You know, casual, only 70 hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we wanted you to, to go to, to a, you know, a, a waste strewn location because we knew these octopuses would, would use that, uh, you know, use the waste to their advantage. Um, but we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And one evening the crew um, came up from their dives. They were um, going through the, they have to, you know, it's tough working actually, because you work really long days in the shallows because you're on re rebreathers, you're not making any bubbles, you're not making um, any sort of visual disturbance in the water. You just look like a fish, you're just sitting there. They're shallow. You can be in shallow water for like up to eight hours on a rebreather without coming to the surface. So you come up, you're pretty tired. Oh yeah. And then they've got to go through their material and check, you know, that it's all working and it's looking good. And they're going through the material and, and, um, our, our director goes, that fish just looked really, you know, upset. What happened? <laughs> and so they played it back and it's like, no, could this be? And, and that's how they made that, that discovery, you know? And then of course our filming changed and it was like, right, we're gonna try and see if we can, uh, you know, see if, see if this is a common thing. And um, we started looking out for it and you, you know, blink and you would miss it. But once you know what you're looking for, you started to see it. Uh, we don't know if it was just that one because we were with one octopus. You know, you, they, they've got their little patches and you, you can pick up the same individual. But we didn't know whether it was just that one individual who's worked it out, um, whether they all do that. It's, you know, it's just the beginning of, it raises so many more scientific questions, which of course is, is fun as well. Um, 
But yeah, we, we now love that optimism. So it's truly a new scientific revelation. Yeah, and, exactly. and speaking of like discoveries from the series itself, there's a, supposedly around 20 scientific yeah. papers that yeah. are going to be published based on the footage gathered during yeah. the filming of the series, which is, is incredible. Yeah, <laughs> well. Yeah. We're, we're very lucky in that regard, I mean, because we spend the time down there and we get to see. I think what it goes to show is how little we, we still know about life beneath the waves. And if we just spend more time down there, we'll find out more. You know, so it's a world we, we need to get to know and we need to get to understand because, of course, it's so influential on our own. Absolutely. Well, let's dive back under the waves and move on to our third clip. Right. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a behavior I think some of you who probably have seen this animal on film in the wild You've seen it displayed before, but this is a unique interaction. And um, it's the orca whale. It's, uh, who loves orcas in here? I do. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a look. That was unbelievable. Right. This is it still gets me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, obviously there's a setup to this that, that is about the lack of sea ice that we encountered when we went to Southern Ocean. And our team sailed there. They were there uh, for seven weeks. And in that time, they saw one hunt lasted for just over four hours. And that's because there's no sea ice. Nowhere for the seals to haul out. There's nowhere for the walker to hunt. And um, he's changing very fast. So we have to share these stories. Sorry. And don't be sorry. This is raw emotion, the salt water. Yeah. We need more of that. We need more people to see these interactions, see these marine creatures and their world changing because of our behavior and giving us the, map, the, the power to do something, to do something. Yeah move forward. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the most gut-wrenching uh, predator-prey interactions that I think we could ever witness right there. My heart was racing the whole time. Was, was your heart racing too? <laughs> yes, yes. And um, orcas being such charismatic megafauna, as we like to call them, and one of the world's favorites, you know, you, they need to eat just like we do. And in order to survive in this watery world, we have to protect their ecosystems like this area and making sure that sea ice um, doesn't continue to break away and melt like it is. Can, can I just say though, that crab eats a seal, wow. Yeah, what a fighter. You know, I, I know some filmmakers that are, oh, seals are so boring. <laughs> yeah. But the crabbies are just amazing. And, the, and there was our cameraman, he'd been done and filmed it before this behavior, but he, he said, we've got to tell it from the seal's perspective. It's a totally different experience. And um, I think it is. And it really so that's the first time it's been told like that. And, um, you know, obviously what we saw was very precious and, and very unique. And, um, you know, I just hope that crabbies and orcas have a future down there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the crab eater was definitely a fighter. It's resilience and was a willingness to survive. And they did it. It was powerful, very powerful storytelling. And I think, James, you know, we only have a few minutes left, but I, I want to make sure that everyone in this room knows what to take away going forward from here. And this is just a sneak peek. Obviously, we would love for you to watch the series on Netflix coming out on November 20th to see the entire series itself. But what's next? How do we get more people involved in protecting our oceans and making sure that they, they step up to the plate? Oh, well, I, I think, you know, it's, it's on us all to talk about them. You know, the first step in this is, is really, um, you know, sharing. The thing is, as Cousteau said, you protect what we love. We've got to love the oceans first. That's why we do this. This is what this is about. If we can talk about the oceans, if we can keep them front of mind, um, if we can get excited about them and feel that they're relevant to us, then that's the first step. That's what we're really trying to do. But, but please spread the word and, and get engaged with the oceans. Uh, you know, and, and at the end of the day, ocean health is vitally important to us all. And it's facing massive crises, as, as you know. Um, there's, of course, the climate crisis, but the pollution crisis um, yeah, and uh, obviously overfishing and uh, biodiversity loss, the extinction crisis, you know, these three things, they all compound together and they change everything. So there's sort of purpose behind, uh, you know, the entertainment. 
um, of this. And, and please take that home and think about it and think about what you might do to get involved. Absolutely. When we have multiple crises, as many of you know, in this, if you're here for Climate Week, you're hearing all week about the problems, the issues, the challenges that we're facing currently and how to, to solve and mitigate climate change. Well, the ocean is one of the, the biggest hubs for solutions when it comes to mitigating climate change. And I'm excited. That's what gets, gets me up out of bed every day is like thinking about what are the possibilities? What's the vision of the world that we want to create um, while focusing on the ocean? Can we just talk a bit more about sea ice for a minute? Because uh, so, you know, oh, we're, we're, we, when we went, um, we went out to Svalbard, which is in the high Arctic, in February, and there wasn't sea ice in the bays. When we went down on this, you know, the team, when they got there, when they eventually got there, it was like, well, we're not going to be able to film anything because we can't find any ice, therefore there's no seals. Uh, our plan B, by the way, was to film krill, uh, because you know, at least you've got big krill aggregations, there's going to be something happening. So uh, you know, we sent in the divers, couldn't find any krill. Um, we've got a very poignant shot in the film of just an empty seascape with one little shrimp swimming through the middle of frame. Um, and this is the Southern Ocean. This is, you know, we regard this as the most remote ocean, but of course it's actually the beating heart of the blue planet. And um, we need to protect it. And at the moment, less than 5% of the Southern Ocean is protected. So. We can all get involved. You know, there's a petition. We can go and sign it today. Um, the only one petition. Um, and send the messages. Because they're discussing about protecting much more of the Southern Ocean than they ever have before right now. Uh, it's a really great um, opportunity for us to make meaningful change. It's just one of the ways in which we as individuals can all feel empowered. Absolutely. And when we look at storytelling and the way that you do your yeah. storytelling, a very specific style that's powerful and poignant, how else can other stories tellers get involved in, in creating more stories about the ocean to create that empathy, as you mentioned? Yeah, well, I think it's really important that, that, that we use moments like this where, where, you know, thanks to Netflix, an incredible spotlight is turned on this subject matter. It's an opportunity for us to all get involved then and to, um, to use it to catalyze the conversation. Uh, and so, you know, I'd say to anyone who's involved in policy making or um, NGOs or conservationists or scientists in this space, it's going to be a great moment to, to celebrate the oceans, to get excited about them, to find the hope uh, and, and to spread the love. Excellent. Excellent. James, any last words, any other things that you well, want no, to Well, no, just thank you so much for coming today. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> just... So thank you all for being here, listening to James Honeyborn, the incredible Emmy Award-winning director, director of Our Oceans, coming out on November 20th on Netflix. So make sure you show up and show out and watch it so we keep it at the top of the list. And then also want to shout out the Netflix team that's here in the room. Thank you for putting this together and, um, and Putera as well. So once again, I'm Danny Washington, James Honeyborn. Talk to us in the back. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>